Welcome back to the Muskogee History Course. We'll continue now from the allotment period to the 1979 Constitution. Now the effects of the allotment, allotments held in trust by the federal government for 25 years. In regard to allotment, full bloods were not allowed to sell their allotments uh, for 25 years. Mixed bloods were allowed to sell immediately and guardians were appointed to handle the allotments of full bloods and orphans. The allotment process proved disastrous for our tribes culturally, politically, and economically. Culturally, the notion of private ownership seriously conflicted with the deeply held Creek tribal belief that land was a sacred resource to be used communally. And politically, the allotment process seriously eroded the role and authority of Creek tribal government. Economically, 60 million acres of land had been sold as surplus in accordance with the Dawes Act. Government officials often intentionally allotted poor land to Indians and labeled more desirable parcels surplus for sale to sellers. Those that opposed the allotment process in the 1895s was Creek Chief Ispaichi, opposed allotment because he believed that it would break up tribal government. In 1900, the Muscogee, hoping that compromise would save their government from extinction, finally agreed to the allotment of their lands. And in 1900, William A. Jones, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, approved regulations that enabled a Creek allottee to sell all of his land except for the 40 acres homestead. However, this regulation was unsuccessful and was replaced by a requirement that the Indian office supervised any sales. Many Indian bloods refused to accept their allotments and a separate government was formed. At this point in Creek history, the Crazy Snake Rebellion had its beginning. During the pre-statehood period, the Curtis Act in 1898, in conjunction with the Dawes Act, was written specifically for the five civilized tribes under which Creek lands were allotted. It also dissolved tribal courts and put tribal funds under the control of the Secretary of the Interior and required presidential approval of all tribal laws. That act provided for forced allotment and termination of tribal land ownership without tribal consent unless the tribe agreed to allotment. It also made tribal laws unenforceable in Indian Territory. And in 1898, Principal Chief Pleasant Porter signed the first and second Creek Agreement which allowed for allotments of Creek lands. This particular slide shows a, a booklet, uh, an index uh, uh, to the final roles uh, of the citizens and freedmen of the five civilized tribes uh, in Indian Territory. It was prepared by the commission and commissioners to the five civilized tribes and approved by the Secretary of the Interior in March 4, 1907. Chito Harjo led a traditional movement against allotment and was an advocate for the traditional clan and Creek government that the United States was attempting to eliminate. The followers of Chito Harjo established a traditional Creek government at Hickory Ground. They cited the Creek Nation's previous treaties with the United States, especially the Treaty of 1832, which had guaranteed them self-government. And we want to take a moment to give you some time to listen to the plea of Crazy Snake. They were bound to take my country away from me. It may have been that my country had to be taken away from me, but it was not justice. I've always been asking for justice. I never had justice. Then it was the overtures of the government to my people to leave their land, the home of their fathers, the land that they loved. He said, it will be better for you to do as I want, for these old treaties cannot be kept any longer. He said, you look away off to the west, away over backward, and there you will see a great river called the Mississippi River, and way over beyond that is another river called the Arkansas River. And he said, you go way out there and you will find a land that is fair to look upon and is fertile, and you go there with your people, and I will give that country to you and your people forever. He said, Go way out there beyond these two rivers, away out the direction of it, and I will locate you and your people there, and I will give you that land forever, 
and I will protect you and your children in it forever. That was the agreement and the treaty, and I and my people came out here and settled on this land, and I carried out these agreements and treaties in all points and violated none. Many Creeks rejected the terms proposed by the Dawes Commission. Here's a picture of Chito Harjo's Patriots. Chito Harjo and his followers were photographed in 1901, and Chito is standing at the far right. The name of Chito Harjo is made up of two Muscogean words, Chito meeting snake and Harjo meeting crazy. The American press referred to Crazy Snake's men and any other Creeks who opposed allotment as Snake Indians. And on this slide, you can see the Chitto's Patriots were in the United States custody in 1909. In the 1867 Constitution in October, the nation adopted a new constitution and a code of laws, an effective framework of government for Creek citizens. The new government was patterned after the United States system. It included three branches, the executive branch, the legislative, and judicial. The Creek government was presided over by an executive branch. The executive branch consisted of a principal chief and second chief elected by male citizens over the age of 18. You can see on this particular slide the Creek and Seminole nations, uh, the way it was back in the 1867s. That particular land area that uh, the Seminoles uh, reside on now, of course, was given to them by the Muscogee Creek Nation. As we continue with the 1867 Constitution, Samuel Schott, or Chicote, was the first principal chief. The legislative branch, or the National Council, was a bicameral form of government made up of a House of Kings, like the Senate, and a House of Warriors, like the House of Representatives. The leaders of the individual tribal towns chose the National Council members according to the traditional system of representation. The Creek Nation was composed of six districts, the Muscogee, Coweta, Arkansas, Eufaula, Deep Fork, North Fork, Okmulgee, and Wewoka. As you can see on the slide where these particular uh, districts are located. The judicial branch consisted of a National Supreme Court composed of five judges chosen by the council, six prosecuting attorneys, and a law enforcement agency. One of the great changes brought about by the 1867 Constitution was the system of voting by secret ballot rather than a visible show of hands. There were some considerations relating to the Constitution. The Muscogee Creek had for hundreds of years been governed by the local tribal towns, which were very powerful in the Muscogee area, and participation in a form of regional council. A large number of Creeks were opposed to any further tampering with their method of government by internal or external elements. Most of the people who felt this way lived in tribal towns and still practiced the original customs and continued to embrace traditional Creek culture. In this particular slide, you can see uh, uh, in our early tribal government the names of our Muscogee Creek chiefs from Samuel Chicote in 1867 to 1875, um, all the way down even to George Tiger in 2012. In this particular slide, you can see the last Creek Nation constitutional election, which was held in 1903 prior to statehood. Concharta election officials. Pleasant Porter was reelected as the principal chief, and Modi Tiger was elected second chief. In 1904, the five civilized tribes drew up a constitution and requested that the Indian Territory be admitted to the Union as an Indian state named Sequoia. You can see the different counties in this slide made up the uh, Indian state of Sequoia. Muscogee Creek people known for being leaders played a significant role in the development of their proposed Indian state. Chief Porter presided over the Sequoia Convention and Alexander Posey, who was Creek poet and journalist, suggested this name of Sequoia. Despite all their efforts in 1907, Oklahoma and Indian Territories were combined and admitted to the Union as the state of Oklahoma. We continue with pre-statehood, and in 1901, all members of the five tribes were made United States citizens. 
Tribal members, including Creeks, did not lose their tribal citizenships or rights when they became American citizens. Creeks have always maintained a strong tribal identity. Executive Office, May 14, 1901. Honorable Billy Yarhola, member of House of Warriors, Nuyaka Town. Dear Sir, you are hereby authorized and directed in accordance with the laws of the Creek Nation to convene the voting members of Nuyaka Town at such time and place as may be most convenient for the purpose of holding an election to elect a member of the House of Kings, to take the place of Conchardi Miko, who has resigned, and to issue to whomsoever is elected a certificate of election. Respectfully, Pleasant Porter, Principal Chief. In 1903, the final elections for Principal Chief and National Council were held. In 1906, the Five Civilized Tribes Act attempted to dissolve the tribal governments. The timeline extended into June of 1907. In 1907, the final National Council meeting at the Council House on 6th Street, downtown Oatmulgee, was conducted. The meeting lasted for three days as the Council sought to resolve all pending issues of national importance before closing the tribal government. In 1907, at this point, the Creek government was not recognized and a period of federally appointed chiefs began. In 1907, the Creek Nation could no longer elect its own head of government, but was forced to accept the Bureau of Indian Affairs choice for principal chief. Contrary to the rights guaranteed to the Creeks in their treaties, the federal actions were deemed illegal and denied the nation's inherent rights of sovereignty. For several decades, Creek leaders continued to fight for status, to elect their tribal leaders, and to reestablish their government. In an attempt to reorganize Creek government in 1909, the tribal towns elected delegates and convened the Creek Convention. However, the United States did not recognize the tribal government. The Miriam Report of 1928 on Indian Economic and Social Conditions revealed an existence of poverty, suffering, and discontent. It was concluded that Indians suffered from disease and malnutrition with a life expectancy of 44 years and an average annual per capita income of only $100. Many Creeks participated in this study. The impact of this report led to the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 allowing Indian tribes throughout the country to establish tribal governments later resulting in the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act that would affect Creek government. Commissioner of Indian Affairs John Collier believed that Indian culture and Indian values had much to offer non-Indian society and that Indian problems were best solved by Indians. Congress passed the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act on June the 26th of 1936 for tribes in Oklahoma. The OIWA was similar in objectives to the Indian Reorganization Act, or the IRA. The Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act affected Creek Nation in the following ways. It stopped the allotment process, ended the loss of Indian lands, and reestablished tribal governments. The Creeks recognized that the OIWA was modeled after the IRA was written without tribal input its ratification was highly irregular, and that the tribal governments would contradict the tribal cultures. A typical OIWA constitution established a governing board, often called a business committee, and did not provide for a separation of powers. The executive, legislative, and in many instances, the judicial functions were performed by the governing board. Adult tribal members make up the general council membership with each having voting privileges. Creeks refused to adopt the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act, fearing that the federal government would force an alien government on citizens of the Creek Nation. It was believed by the Creeks that the citizens would best benefit by not accepting the requirements of the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. Creek leaders petitioned Commissioner Collier to allow for an election of the principal chief and the second chief. In 1938, Thoplaco tribal towns adopted its own government under the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. So did Alabama Quasardi, the tribal town, in 1939. The Kaleji tribal town adopted its government in 1941. 
These three tribal towns located in or near Wetumpka were developed during the administration of Roly Kennard, also a Wetumpka resident. In 1934, delegates of 42 tribal towns elected their first principal chief in 31 years. In 1939, the Secretary of Interior sent a letter to the President recognizing the Creek Convention as the legislative body of the tribe. The convention at this time was functioning much as a council had earlier. And in 1944, the Muscogee General Convention adopted a new constitution and bylaws. Under the new constitution, the executive and legislative branches were merged into one body, the Creek Indian Council. The Creek Indian Council through the 1944 Constitution, followed a pattern of self-government that evolved over the course of more than a century. This government never received BIA approval because the new governing document excluded the freedmen without giving Creek citizens the opportunity to vote on that provision. In 1950, Chief John Davis did not recognize the Creek Indian Council on the basis that their credentials were improper and irregular and repudiated the 1944 Constitution. He immediately appointed members of the various tribal towns as the new Creek Indian Council, reversing the trend of having tribal towns elect the chief. And in less than 15 years after passing the IRA, the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act, legislation to rebuild tribal towns, Congress reversed its goal to strengthen Indian sovereignty and tribal governments by terminating federal governmental responsibilities to the tribes and to integrate Indians into the white communities of the resident states. The BIA, in dealing with the Creek government, began to favor termination policies under House Concurrent Resolution 108, which would terminate the office of principal chief and eliminate any further elections of the chiefs. In the mid-1950s, the BIA refused the Creeks the right to elect a chief, and the office was filled by a BIA appointee until 1970. And since the appointment of the Creek Tribal Council in the early 1950s, the council served as an advisory more than a legislative capacity in regard to conduct of tribal affairs by the chief and the BIA. Indian reports and the effects on the Creek Nation the Commission on the Rights, Liberties, and Responsibilities of the Indian in 1966. These particular reports were uh, essential because, uh, generally speaking, the United States government wanted to know what was going on in the Indian world. Relocation and Activism. Indian Adult Vocational Training Act of 1956 provided funds for institutional and on-the-job training available only to Indians who relocated to urban areas Many Creeks who moved to cities to achieve economic opportunities for their families continued to maintain ties with their relatives in the Creek Nation. As you can see in the slide, in 1961, a week-long gathering at the University of Chicago attracted hundreds of Indian people from across the country. The Chicago American Indian Conference resulted in a declaration of Indian purpose and helped mobilize a generation of Indian activists. This photograph illustrates both the broad representation at the conference and the growing strains of generational conflict. Much of the activism began with the National Indian Youth Council, followed by the founding of the American Indian Movement, the AIM Movement, in 1968, which ushered in a new period of Indian militancy. In 1968, the Indian Civil Rights Act provides a Bill of Rights to protect individual Indians from abuses of power by tribal governments. And in 1969, a group of Indians occupied Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay. The activists claimed rights to the land under the terms of the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. In the tribal development, tribal towns asserted more control over social and political life due to general mistrust of federally appointed chiefs. And in 1964, the Indian Claims Commission awarded the Creek Nation $2.9 million in recompense of federal violations of the 1814 Treaty. In 1965, a further award of $1 million was made for violation of the 1856 Treaty. The Office of Economic Opportunity allows Creek Nation to begin creating funding for their own community programs. Termination had clearly failed to liberate Indians or to solve the Indian problem. The major recommendation of each report was that the Indians be given greater self-determination. 
That is greater control in governing the reservations and greater participation in planning federal Indian policy. President Nixon, in a speech to Congress, denounced termination and pledged federal government resources to strengthen the Indian sense of autonomy without threatening his sense of community. In the Muscogee Creek Nation government, tribal sovereignty levels throughout the history of the United States is shown in this slide. Tribal sovereignty is the right to govern ourselves, to define our own citizenship, to manage tribal property, regulate commerce, and maintain law and order. It further recognizes the existence of the government-to-government -government relationship with the federal government. In 1970, Principal Chiefs Act, the PL 91-495, granted Creek Nation permission to vote for Principal Chief. In 1971, Claude Cox was the first elected Principal Chief under the new Constitution since 1903. In 1975, PL 93 638, the Self-Determination and Indian Education Act passed certain rights of sovereignty and rights to education back to the Indian nations. And in 1976, Harjo versus Kleppe decision acknowledges Creek right to self-governance by ensuring the creation of a legally constituted Creek national legislature. Tribal governments can now manage their own housing, law enforcement, education, health, social service, and community development programs. The Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 and the American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in 1978 further solidified the government's attempt to recognize and respect tribal cultural rights. At this point, we're going to take a break and we will continue with the next video in our series.